is 5 30 and i'd like to call to order our meeting please if you're able stand and join us in saying the pledge of allegiance i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all all right next next i would look for a motion to approve our agenda yes jim I'll move adoption of the agenda with the addition of the human capital addendum that was located at our work location. Second. Oh, a twin second. Oh, um, all right, let's move by Jim and seconded by Naval. Any discussion? All right, all in favor, please say yes. 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 Yeah. Any opposed? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Any opposed, same sign? All right, motion passes. Next, we'll move on to our recognition of the audience. At this time, the board will hear comments from the public. We ask that each speaker who has signed up to address the board state their name and home school district for the record. Speakers must refrain from using this form to criticize or complain about a specific employee or student by name. Vulgar or profane language will not be tolerated. The board is interested in your comments and will listen carefully, but is not obligated to respond to or debate issues in this forum. This evening, one speaker has signed up to address the board. This speaker will be allotted a maximum of three minutes. Upon conclusion of the allotted time, a chime will sound and the speaker will, is asked to conclude. If necessary, a final chime will sound 15 seconds later, signifying the end of the speaker's time at the podium. I will now call our speaker to the podium, who is Devin Stachinsky. Devin Stachinsky, HMR. Um, you'll have to forgive me, the weather had, uh, has hampered my ability to access a printer this afternoon to print off the memos. So I'll have to go by the snippets that I took out of them. Uh, first, we'll, uh, we'll start with memo 94. One of your statements in it is that this evaluation reflects the unanimous opinion of the individual board members. So my question is, where do any dissenting opinions go? Because there clearly wasn't any in Memo 94. For example, your conclusion was that everything is absolutely hunky-dory, status quo. Keep Keep sailing the course. I would like to note one statement made in that section three, where it says, one comment suggested that Dr. Gandhi focus on improving test scores, but to balance this goal with the need for long-term facility planning. Now, you're not gonna be able to keep a school open if the kids can't read or do math. So much so that, was it, over a thousand students are open enrolling into West Fargo? Something I asked um, your long range facility coordinator uh, at one of the public meetings was, what would you guys do in your long range facility plan if West Fargo all of a sudden didn't, didn't allow open enrollment and you had to take those thousand kids back. Because that's apparently not also in your long range facility plan to take those students back. Wouldn't the plan be to make schools so nice and good in Fargo that we would be getting all, you know, basically that trend would reverse and we get all those kids back and then more kids would come over across the line. Wouldn't that be the intent? I mean, your, your long range plan pretty much means nothing if the kids are leaving. Um, quickly on to memo 96, I'm concerned with the board's use of taxpayer money with, you know, Trollwood being outside of the state and outside of the district boundaries and trying to create a quote, non-public school inside a public school. 
How? Thank you very much. Um, before we move on, and I apologize that I didn't do this earlier, I just want to note that Robin Nelson and Seth Holden are joining us virtually, as well as uh, Assistant Superintendent um, Missy Eitzness. So just for the record. All right, we will move on to our report section. And first we have up our FEA report. Well, good evening, President Berkland and members of the board. Uh, I want to begin by walking through several of the business memos that you have in front of you for action tonight. Uh, firstly, memo number 94 is the superintendent evaluation. And several staff members, including some that I typically don't really hear from uh, as somebody who has read through board memos, have reached out to me about this after they've read uh, the superintendent evaluation or received it uh, maybe from a text from a friend and uh, asked me a question that, that resonated. They asked if I've ever received an evaluation after nine years teaching in Fargo Public Schools that did not identify any areas for growth. And I really reflected on that and I unfortunately don't think I can say that I have. And I think that's true for most, if not all teachers in this district a very similar experience is had where there is constantly something that can be identified for growth. Typically, there is something that deserves added attention, the ability to grow, maybe in skills or knowledge or ability. Within memo number 94, the board's evaluation of the superintendent indicates that no weaknesses were identified for the superintendent. This is truly extraordinary and remarkable. One year ago, I went back to look, there were two areas of weakness identified in the superintendent's evaluation. The first said communication among the staff and teachers needs to be strengthened. In approving this evaluation tonight, it will be assumed by FEA leadership that the board is satisfied with Dr. Gandhi's communication with staff and teachers and feel that remarkable progress has been made over the last year. The second area for improvement last year was student achievement and growth relating to underperforming black, native, and Spanish students as the report was worded. Again, in approving of this evaluation tonight, it will be assumed by the FEA leadership that this board is satisfied with the student achievement of black, native, and Spanish students in our district. If no changes are to be made, I would recommend and request that board members reach out to me to explain the progress that you feel the superintendent has made on these two issues over the last year. Memo number 95 and 96 all lumped together here. We had a building representative meeting on Monday night and a lot of discussion and uncertainty came up at the BR meeting. There were several questions from BRs about these new schools or education models. And I want to share just a sampling of their questions, which I would encourage you to uh, seek out answers to prior to approving these plans. One question was, who is staffing these new educational models? Another similar question, would we be looking at making new hires or transferring existing staff? If we're transferring staff, are those transfers voluntary? or would they be involuntary? All three of those questions together, how is the staffing of this new model going to occur? Then there was a, a large question raised about what effect these programs might have on existing opportunities for students, especially considering that building enrollments might decrease as a result of implementing these, and some existing opportunities like foreign language, music, physical education, and art, course offerings are dependent on having a large base of students to ensure current course offerings continue. Another question, what are, uh, where are these programs being housed and what effect does that have on the current programming in those buildings? And lastly, is there truly space available at Explorer Academy for the Mental Health Therapeutic Treatment Center? Uh, a particular question about that exact placement was raised. 
Uh, that all came as of uh, Monday evening that those questions uh, came through, so I, I wanted to share them with you here tonight. Uh, next is memo number 97, where Dr. Gandhi presents the unified strategic and operational plan. In introducing that plan, he writes, therefore, starting with this year, administration presents a unified strategic and operational plan for approval prior to beginning the budget building process for the following year. This allows us to make budgetary decisions and allocate our resources in accordance with the identified priorities in the unified strategic and operational plan. I read that to you just to highlight the importance of this plan. Board members really truly need to understand the implications of their approval of this plan and should ask Dr. Gandhi to specify what changes this could have on programming in our schools. For example, there's reason for concern about the unintended consequences if the board were to set increasing graduation rates as the priority without also stipulating a priority about students engaging in physical education coursework beyond the state graduation requirements as Fargo Public Schools currently requires. That's just one example of a kind of cause and effect relationship that could potentially apply to other situations. Board members should have clarity of any unintended consequences approving this unified strategic plan might have, such as reduction in certified physical education teachers over time, and therefore the reduction in available coaching staff to carry out strategic initiative three. Lastly, about ESSER funding positions. And this section is more difficult for me. I've had a lot of conversations behind the scenes in an attempt to avoid any kind of public comment on this. Ultimately, though, I feel I've done everything in my power to advocate, and yet administration and the board have been steadfastly resistant to responding in a way that addresses the concern. And I'm cognizant, as I prepare to share these remarks in this last section, uh, of some of you on the board who feel my speaking at you in this way just airs dirty laundry in the public. I've heard some of you shut down when I start raising concerns from the podium. And some of you have warned me to be careful what I say because your fellow board members might be erratic based on what they hear at the podium, and it can actually result in their position becoming less favorable to educators. And so I'm aware of that perception, but unfortunately those attributes are not the truth. That's not why I speak to you. So I'm hopeful that the remarks will help you understand the number of ways that I've tried to avoid coming to a spot where I address this concern publicly, and also explains why there is no other remedy at this point but to appeal to the full board. Since the last FEA report at a board meeting, I've had a couple of meetings with Dr. Gandhi. At the first meeting, I asked about the process being used to determine funding for continuation of ESSER-funded positions. It's the position of the FEA that roughly $3.7 million of the estimated $17 million available to increase salaries for teachers was set aside for the purpose of alleviating the budgeting nightmare that could have been caused when ESSER funds run out at the end of this year. When deciding at the negotiations table how to calculate salaries, a decision was made to keep all 36 FTEs that were ESSER funded in the matrix for calculations, instead of assuming that they would transition back to open positions caused by resignations or retirements. At my first meeting about a month ago, Dr. Gandhi directed me to talk with Jackie Gap, business manager, and Jeff McKenna, the human capital director. In a brief email exchange with Jackie, she redirected me back to a member of the cabinet to answer my questions, but said ESSER funded positions will not be renewed. Given the discrepancy between that answer and what the FEA believed was negotiated, and having been now directed to go back to cabinet, I reached back out to Dr. Gandhi, who said the answer to my question about funding could not be answered until the board sets its strategic priorities. That's why that document becomes so important tonight. I also scheduled a meeting with Dr. McKenna. 
Jeff was able to share the process being used to close out all the ESSER positions. However, it was not in his scope to discuss the decision made at negotiations to allocate $3.7 million for the ESSER positions. And so having given the superintendent and the business manager and the human capital director opportunities to adjust to the spirit of negotiations, I appealed to the board's negotiations committee. In an email to the board president and Mr. Holden, the negotiations chair. In listening to the board negotiations committee meeting, I learned that the board felt this matter was administrative in function. As such, I was back on the carousel. Since that audio, I've been able to have meetings with President Birkeland, Mr. Holden, and Dr. Gandhi. Somewhere in the midst of all of this, I learned that Jackie Gap is no longer a member of the cabinet, and that instead Bill Westrick would be the appropriate person to talk to about budgeting. However, he too was unable to address the concern from a negotiations perspective. That's a responsibility of the board. And so we have administration telling me that my concern needs to be addressed by the board, and we have the board saying that this is a function of administration. That's a problem. And since the board has neglected its responsibility for oversight on the implementation of decisions made at the negotiations table, I'm left with no other opportunity than to advocate for what is true by using time tonight to share the work that I've done surrounding this issue and to again appeal to the board but this time the entire board, to engage in proper oversight on the implementation of the contract. Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll move on to our administration report. Dr. Gandhi. Thank you. I was not uh, here along with some of the other cabinet members at the last board meeting, so I do have a little bit more of a lengthy update today just to share a couple of different pieces if I can get IT to allow me to project. Ah. Sorry, this is loading. So I actually had to create a little bit of PowerPoint because I had a couple of different pieces of information since our last meeting um, that I wanted to share today in our superintendent update. Uh, I think first, most of you know that the last meeting administration presence was a little bit light because we had a large group of our district office administrators at uh, the School Superintendent Association's National Conference on Education. It's one of the largest conferences on education for district and school leadership. And one of the things coming out of the conference, um, well, I guess I want to share two things. One is that one of the reasons that we had a large amount of district staff at that conference is because of some of the work that we're doing in Fargo Public Schools that was really highlighted at a national level um, to the point where we've already started receiving uh, inquiries for a lot of us to come back and present last year as well. So some of the work that we've been doing in Fargo Public Schools um, is being recognized and looking at the conference and where education is going and where education is headed, um, just want to really highlight some of the pieces that we are doing uh, that's in line or I would even say in advance of a lot of other school districts, comparable school districts in the nation. First and foremost is, is a next education workforce and you heard a little bit about that through the FEA report and I'll be able to talk a little bit more about that when we get to memo number 95 as well. Uh, looking at changing a traditional model of a one-to-one -one teacher to be able to provide more teachers that are supportive or more teachers that can assist with a, having a group of educators own a learning studio which is defined as 100 to 120 students. This is a model coming out of Arizona State University. Uh, Dr. Carol Basile is uh, the leader of kind of this movement because Arizona's had some of the highest amount of teacher shortages in the nation. And so just responsive to that, coming up with some different models. She is actually going to be the keynote speaker at next year's conference on education. Uh, we are going to be one of the flagship schools that are already implementing this model outside of the state of Arizona. Working with DPI will be the first school district in North Dakota to do that. Uh, in fact, uh, 
Dr. McKenna, uh, Dr. Fremstad from our team were able to go to Arizona this fall with members of, uh, with the executive director and the president of ND United, the state superintendent, and several other individuals to take a look at this model. Um, and that's gonna be the model that we are implementing at the self-directed academy. I know there were some questions from FEA building leadership. We actually, in a couple of weeks, are sending Dr. Gross and even Jim Erlocker, who is one of the, the negotiators for the FEA, um, to Arizona to be able to learn more about this model that we're going to be implementing at our self-directed academy um, to, to kind of share that piece um, because it really is geared on how to support students by also supporting teachers more and allowing them to focus more on their craft with a level of support so they don't feel as isolated as the traditional model does in the classroom. So one of the big pieces that is kind of a huge trend that we're going to, I think some of the work that we're doing around school choice, strategic alignment and resource allocation are, up, are also well advanced of where education is heading, what a lot of school districts are doing. So just a lot of this work was, was highlighted. Um, the executive director of the School Superintendents Association talked specifically in his keynote speech about this example of a parent to teacher pipeline that started in the works and then there was someone in South Dakota that picked it up and now they're, they're doing that work as well. Uh, he actually misspoke, it was North Dakota, uh, which is why Dr. McKenna was there with Lori Matsky from DPI, uh, creating more of that opportunity to create a parent to teacher pipeline as well. Um, again, getting elevated at the national level. I would say some of the work that we are doing around AI and mental health is also um, is also a highlight for other school districts across the nation. I think that we are well advanced in, in our AI implementation and embedding how that impacts education and where education is headed. And I think most of you know, but our school district uh, is one of the few grantees across the nation to become a flagship school district around providing mental health. Uh, it's called the JED Foundation's Comprehensive Mental Health Package where there is no intended outcome besides Uh, either the battery's dead or that's a very good sign to wrap it up. Um, <laughs> so I do believe, um, just wanted to highlight that piece. The biggest uh, pride moment for Fargo Public Schools uh, was that our director of standards-based instruction was one of two national finalists uh, for Women in School Leadership Award and just want to recognize Dr. Lee and Hansen and the work that they're doing, uh, specifically around her work around uh, standards-based instruction and evidence-based reporting. Uh, to the point where even the week after we came back from the conference, two of her team members were nationally published um, in one of the leading magazines. Uh, these are two of uh, our teachers and our, our lead, teacher leaders in our school district. They're doing their work around evidence-based learning and reporting um, in Edutopia, which is a huge magazine for instructional pedagogy and practice that is being celebrated across the nation as well. So just want to highlight some of those pieces of work. I have more celebration, sorry, that's why I have a lot of updates today. Uh, some of the most modest individuals in our, uh, in, in our school district are our employees in our communications department that work behind the scenes tremendously hard uh, for a wide variety of aspects. Uh, the culminating award for any entity around advertising and publication is called the Addies. There's a little bit of a description of the Addies that you can see there as well, the amount of entries that go into um, creating the ad or amount of entries are submitted for Addy Awards every year, how big of an award this is, and our communications team won the silver award for last year's annual report. Um, just last night or last Friday night was the award ceremony where going into the ceremony we didn't even know uh, which pieces that we submitted were going to be awarded, but a huge accomplishment for Anne-Marie Tyler Brown and every other member of, of our team as well. So just some great work happening with our communications department. Wanted to give a brief update. I know through some other committee meetings we've talked about an HR staff survey that we sent out. And uh, there's been some questions about what's gonna happen. Will we have access to the data as a board, our community, our stakeholders with that staff survey as well. The reason that we've been a little bit kind of nebulous in terms of just like deadlines and timelines for that staff survey is because 
we've been working with Vital Network, which is legislatively, that was a group that was funded by the state to be able to do some of this work around employee engagement to deliver the survey. So what you have in front of you is just kind of a rough plan. So they're putting together a dashboard that will be publicly available. And then you just see kind of our district plan on how we plan to utilize that survey, meet with district leadership, meet with building leadership, meet with employees. Uh, just wanted to provide some clarity in terms of what our intended goals are uh, in terms uh, not just kind of serving individuals, but what our next plans are afterwards as well. So wanted to give an update on that because I know I've received some questions from some board members about that. Lastly, I know that you've had your board member two by twos as we continue to work on our long range facility planning. Uh, just wanted to let you know that we're also doing some very specific focused community uh, meetings. Uh, spe specifically for some of the buildings or communities that have been impacted the most uh, by where that draft plan is in its present day. And I use those qualifiers because, uh, as you know, this is an iterative process and the plan continues to change. So uh, just over the last couple of weeks or in the upcoming weeks, you see that we are meeting with Madison Community, the Fargo Neighborhood Coalition, Jefferson Community, Eagles Community, CBH Community, HMR Community, the Dakota High School and Adult Ed and ECSE staff, the McKinley community, the Ben Franklin community, and then the uh, Horace Mann Roosevelt and Downtown Neighborhood Associations are all scheduled uh, to talk about the Long Range Facilities Plan and get feedback from those groups as well, um, or short, share more about uh, where we are in that planning process. So just wanted to let you know of some of that work. Lastly, I am not sure if you saw it on your way in or not, but in this, Last year or not, we are in the last year or so, our planning committee has been approached by Bonanzaville about a, a stone that recognizes where Theodore Roosevelt gave one of his famous speeches. Um, that was actually done on this property through planning. It was decided to, um, now that we've moved back into this building, to bring that back here. So that's located right outside of this boardroom to your right. It is very big. If you have not seen it, you will see it. Um, so just wanted to close the loop on that and share an update about that being available as well. So I apologize for the lengthy update, but I believe we had a lot of celebrations for our district that I wanted to acknowledge. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments? Uh, the agenda lists uh, memo 91 enrollment projections. Was that going to continue to be part of admin report or are we pushing that back? Since that's usually Missy's thing, maybe we'll wait till she's here. Um, but just Rob is on to give that presentation. Yeah, and I apologize. This is just part of the 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 new admin report. Um, so I I kind of forgot that uh, it's not a separate agenda item, and I was just waiting for that. So we do have uh, this is the time of the year we do our annual. RSP report, um, our enrollment projection and demographic reports. So we do have Rob that is with us from RSP. Uh, similar to last year, he will present some of the information in your board memo. I did provide some high level information. Um, the thousand foot perspective is what one of the pages on his report always is. This year I purposely did not include in the board memo um, I included the enrollment inf or the demographic information. I did not look, include the building specific information uh, just because I didn't want to throw another variable in play while we have the long range facility plan happening as well because we know that that's going to shift um, some potential movement as well. So I will now hand it over to Rob for the uh, enrollment projections. Good evening, Dr. Gandhi and Board of Education. Um, Rob Schwartz coming to you from Kansas City. I was going to whine about how it was 80 degrees here today, and it's going to be zero when I wake up in the morning, but I know you guys were in a blizzard, so it's worse, mm -hmm. worse. Um, as Dr. Gandhi indicated, um, this is our annual report, and um, there's a lot of cool things in here. Um, I've been asked to stay at the 100,000-foot perspective. Um, I'll give you some details because there are some things that are happening in your district that you need to be um, cognizant of in how you plan, um, specifically with your 
facilities master's plan. This report is set up to help you understand some of the storyline arcs with some of the data. Everything is steeped in the data and nothing really from a assumption beyond something that we can track back to data, whether it's like birth data, demographics, migration, all of these different things. The report is set up in four parts. Part one is the enrollment and demographics. Part two is the development and growth trends. Part three is projections. And then part four, are some next steps or things to consider um, in your deliberation of what's happening with your enrollments. So let's talk a little bit about that 100,000 foot perspective. And I think Dr. Gandhi indicated this is something that you guys have seen. Um, one of the things that um, we're looking at is the enrollment is going to be stable. So some things are increasing. So when we look at the elementary and the middle school, they're increasing, but the high school is decreasing by a little bit. Not enough that it's alarming to say you're in a decreasing mode. There are some capacity and utilization issues. We'll talk about that as it relates to reside and attend enrollments. There's quite a bit of development that's going to be really being pushed forward with the diversion project being completed here in the near future. We'll talk about that in that section. We always have visuals. Your district is so long north and south, it's hard to put it into a presentation. So we have some insets in each of our maps, again, recognizing the district goes beyond where we've zoomed in. We have the existing elementary attendance zones, and of course, your secondary zones. We have our existing feeder system. Dotted lines represent where there's splits as they go from elementary to middle school, but we have a complete middle school to high school. We further break your district into planning areas. This is essential in our statistical analysis of what's happening with demographics, development, and enrollment trends. All of the dots that you see up here are represented of the year in which units were built. One of the variables that we look at. This is a statistical forecast model. So meaning it's not just assumptions, it's based on the data. A lot of the data is census data, county data sets, city data sets, and of course school district data sets, and then data analysis that we put together um, that's exclusive to how we look at what's happening with things specific, if it's a apartment complex, a mobile home, townhomes, duplexes, or even single family developments. Every single one of these planning areas are impacted differently by some of the economic trends that are occurring in your community, your state, and of course nationally. One thing that we always showcase is live births. So here in Cass County, we have the live births from 2005 to 2022. We go to the last two columns of this table. You can see the number of kindergartners that we've received five years later. We also then give what is our market rate of kindergartners out of this metric of live births of Cass County. We know that people move in and out of the county that had their babies born five years ago, six years ago. But this is just a way to kind of get an understanding of where could the number of kindergartners be. This last year was one of our lowest number of kindergartners with 783. We show you a low and high range of what that potentially could be based on what we get for our market share based on five years ago live births and just one of our metrics. When we look at the enrollment by grade, a key thing that stands out in this forecast is we look at the senior class and uh, last year it was 831 students. And then when I look at your kindergarten class of 783, more graduating than those coming in for this last year. That's not always been the case. When you go up those columns, you can see there's most years where we may have fewer seniors than the following year's incoming kindergarten class. This seems to be an outlier when we look at that particular outcome for this year. We look at some of the change that happens year to year. We refer that 
as cohorts. So how does the first to second grade change year in and year out versus the eighth to ninth grade? What we can see here is we have a mixed bag where some grades will have increases one year and other grades a decrease. One of the consistents where we have an increase is from eighth to ninth grade. That's pretty typical of all the school districts we work with in North Dakota. Um, but you can see some of the things that have been happening where there are grades at the elementary level where there's decreases some years and some years there's increases. So again, this gets at things I would refer to as migration or subdivision life cycles that we provide you some visuals. So that first stopping point is migration. So simply stated here, we're trying to understand how or where or what number of students are new to the district that's represented in the orange bar, so the right side in the grade bands of elementary, middle school, and high school for the last three school years. We like that side. That means those are new to the district. The green part of the bars are students that were here the previous year of that year of analysis that are not receiving services in that school year. So they've left the district. So we clearly see one of the things that's impacting us is migration. And we tend to have more elementary students that have left the district than those that are coming in year in and year out. That impacts our future enrollment moving forward, impacting what we might see for a growth or decline of students. And so when we look at the last three years, we've netted a decrease. Not a large decrease, but we still have a decrease. When we look at those planning areas throughout the district, this map visualizes what's changed has happened from 1920 to 23-24 for all K-12 students. Orange is where we've had an increase. Green is where there's been a decrease. Can just give you a visual of how this model is starting to look at things. This map provides a visual of where the students are located. Again, it's all K-12 students. The red areas are where we have the greatest density. So you can see we have a couple pockets um, here on the central and then what I would say more on the south side where it's the most dense. Again, most of our observations here I've stated, um, this is just to help you kind of summarize what you've seen in some of those maps or tables. We get into the development. This visual is one that I show every district because it helps us understand, is there some sort of correlation to population, which is represented by the census data, the green line. And so it's above zero. We have people that are moving into your community. We look at the blue line that represents the certificate of occupancies. So what type of building activity is occurring? There's a delay here with certificate of occupancies. This is when people can actually move into the homes or apartments that are being built. So it may be the building permits were issued in 2022, but you can't move into it until it's finished in 2023. So we know there's building activity, but then when we look at our enrollments, um, it's kind of been flat um, and slight decreases. This is best explained by some of the demographics. And some of this we'll talk about with the development, with the age of inventory, the value of inventory, that's impacting the millennial generation of where they live. We know they're waiting longer and having fewer kids. So if we're not having a lot of building activity, um, this is gonna impact what we see for the number of kids. We do break the yield rate by each of the elementary attendance areas for K-5 students. So you get a sense of the number of kids that we're yielding for every 100 single family units. The bottom row is the district average. In 2010, we were at 18 K through five students for every 100 units. We've declined to about 15. But in this time period, we have built almost 2,500 single family units. That's how with the decline, we've been able to have either an increase or stable enrollments. Where you see orange shading, it's more than three greater than that district average. And where it's shaded in green, it's three smaller than what that district average is or more. So you get a sense of what that is for each of these attendance areas and what it's done since 2010. We do the same thing for multifamily units. 
and we've been pretty darn stable with multifamily units with seven for every 100 units k5 students and it's slightly increased now to eight you can see some years where it ballooned up to nine we've looked at the evaluation of the product age on this map the orange and red as we go to the south, that's the newest, right? We have a couple pockets up in the, the core area that are new, but for the most part, most of that inventory was built before 1990. Some of that quite a bit longer ago than that. We look at the building activity, it's predominantly in the south side, right? I'm not telling you anything you guys don't know as you drive to the south side. Again, this is just a map to help visualize what you're seeing. When we look at development over time, this visual gives us an understanding of the units that were available at the start of the decade, which is that magenta purple color. And then the orange yellow color is the units that were built in that decade, except for the last column. That's just the last two years. From the information of the tours that I've done in your district um, in the fall, and the conversations we've had with the cities to understand what's happening with developments and how we can better apply a timing of some of the developments. Years ago, we talked about how there were replats of developments where they were platting for smaller lots, and that was making things more affordable for some of the housing inventory as we moved down towards Davies High School. This map is another way of looking at the previous map where it's a bar graph that shows the number of units that potentially could come online in these specific areas. And just another visual of looking at this. All of this is tied back to this table to help us understand uh, a naming convention that we've given it, what the timing of that growth is. So green is current, yellow potentially in the next five years, purple would be closer to 10 years or beyond. The number of potential units that could be built along with the existing units. So you get a sense of how this starts to relate to the timing component in our modeling. And we have building activity that um, really has slowed in the last few years, but as the diversion gets completed, um, we are anticipating an increase in some of the development opportunities um, on the south side. This is important. Um, as many of you may know, we also do um, this same service for West Fargo Public Schools. And so we know that while the diversion has been being built, designed that whole time period, things have moved to the West. We're anticipating that there's going to be some movement back into your district on the South side. There is a limit on the number of units we can build, build in your region. It's important to understand both sides. Um, this visual here gives you the perspective of the accuracy of our projections each of the years we've done it, whether it's year five of the projections, year four, three, two, or one, for all the projections that we've done going back to 13, 14. This is an important slide for you to understand that as you start to apply what we're saying potentially should happen in your district for enrollment at each of these grade levels, how does this impact your facility master planning components on what you need to do at the elementary, middle school, or high school. This is a huge component. This also gets into um, projects that may be in older parts or the northern part of your community. How does that start to regreen? So as you start to put forth some things in that facility master plan, we're anticipating next year when we do this, there may be some changes that we um, start to play out um, specifically where you may have some projects for buildings that may um, be an incentive for people to re-green, uh, move into some of these older areas. That stated, as we started to look at what some of these changes might mean for the future with life verse, migration, development, the subdivision recycle of existing developments, um, this is the outlook of our forecast going out to 2028-29. Um, and that's where, again, that 100,000 foot perspective, a stable enrollment. And that's quite remarkable when you consider the limited development that we've had, the aging inventory, 
the value of our inventory, um, the type of product. Um, quite remarkable that we're going to stay stable and start to potentially see some signs where it could increase. I do want to touch upon um, one thing that um, as far as out of district students, I know that from Fargo, um, there's less than, I believe, 150 students that go from Fargo to West Fargo. So I thought that was interesting um, comment made earlier in um, your board meeting. Um, but from the data that we presented, we know where kids are both in Fargo and West Fargo. Um, when we look at what this means for your projections, um, there's a lot of information here. And that's why page 34, you'll want to reference. I'm going to tell you everything on page 34 um, with this building. Um, just to give you a sense of, yeah, we, we have this, this larger level for each of the grade bands. But as you start to look at the buildings, there's a lot of things that, that again, starts to have you go down some rabbit holes of conversations of capacity. What does it mean? Um, does it need to change? Are there different ways that we look at it? Th those are conversations I imagine are being played out um, with your facility master plan. But with the target enrollment that we have for the buildings that's listed for each of these, um, when we look at the past enrollment, we show for each building three different ways in which that looks. The middle row green font is reside. So based on where a student residence address is, how does it relate to the attendance boundary? So that's, that's the number of kids that are being served K through five since I'm looking at elementary here. When I look at the blue bottom row for every building, that's attends. That's based on the student data who's actually in seats in that building. The top row, purple font, reside slash attend is a subset of reside, so they actually reside and attend that building. This gets at a, uh, a school choice, and I'm saying school choice with this definition. Sometimes it may be the household that is choosing where the student goes through your process. Other times it's where programs are or are not that dictates what building that student would go to. One thing to keep in mind, the reside slash attend will never equal reside or attend. But the reside and the attend numbers, when we get to the totals, they will equal each other because of the way in which we're looking at the data. We do show shading um, based on whether a building would be over the target enrollment of 100% or below a 75% target enrollment. All this helps signify is whether you're looking at this from a reside enrollment or attend enrollments? Do we have some issues with the number of kids in the building? Too many? Or are we reaching a point that when we get below 75%, um, we need to find some other ways by which we get more kids in those buildings if the enrollment continues to decline um, in those areas? See this breakdown again for the second half of the elementary buildings? Show that percent utilization um, there for the last five columns. We do the same thing for your middle school and high school buildings. And um, you can see some things that we've um, tried to apply with some of the Explorer Academy um, and things of that nature with those grade breakdowns. Because we know that those students come out of the reside to those programs to be serviced. And then we've also provided the district a starting point for how you staff for next year. So what it would look like if everybody went to the buildings that they should go to based on the attendance zone. So you see this here for reside and then where it might lead itself with the trends of how students may matriculate to some of the different buildings. This is the attend. Um, basically some observations here. We're happy that the diversion's reaching a point where we're going to start seeing more building activity on the south side from the standpoint of how it has slowed down. Um, we think that should start to pick up. Um, we have to watch some of the things that are happening with our enrollment trends with migration patterns and uh, some of the subdivision life cycles. As I talk about really the last, last page, for you all this evening is the key considerations. Um, I always leave live verse 
that's a huge indicator of what we may see for kindergartners in five years. It's not the only metric we use for kindergartners. I think we have some other tools based on the housing inventory, the type of units, number of units, and what we've seen in some of these planning areas over time that are much better than the live verse. But the live verse gives us an, a control mechanism. If it goes down, we know that we should for sure have fewer kindergartners in some of those years in the future. I've already mentioned the larger senior class graduating with smaller classes coming in in kindergarten. If that is something that would become a more regular um, action, we're going to see fewer kids than what we forecasted. Migration trends, if we could find a way, if we knew the reasons, because I don't know it in the data, I don't have any reasons why kids moved out or why kids moved in um, specifically. But if we could reverse the out migration of elementary kids where that would become stable to a slight increase, um, we'd have a very, very different outlook on what our enrollment forecast is. Um, so that, that's an important piece. And then of course, the development trends do things build out in the outlook that the city, the builders, the developers have. Um, there is some potential negative things that are kind of stirring themselves up with uh, mortgage interest rates. Um, that's changed from two months ago where they were thinking it might go towards 5%. Now we're hearing things um, as late as yesterday that it might be more in a 9% range. So that, that's gonna have an impact of how fast housing inventory moves. But this is, this is your status of your enrollment. Um, I guess the good news is it's a stable enrollment. Um, there's some challenges at individual buildings, um, but nothing that um, can't be managed um, through some conversations you have with administration, you, the board, and of course the public. So I yield back to any questions, comments that anyone might have. All right, thank you so much. Any questions or comments? The report. Yeah. I have a question, Melissa. Oh, thank you, Robin. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Rob, can you speak to the partnerships and the, the data that you use from the city and planners and demographers? And perhaps Rupa could talk a bit about the, the collaboration and planning between the park district with the, the land around our schools, the pools, and then also with the city. That was a question that we received as board members. Yeah, so okay, I'll kick off with um, the collaboration with the county and city, uh, they've been incredible to work with. Um, there's a lot of information that they will share with our team on some of the timing components, um, their thoughts with what they think the market may look like, um, how different housing product may move, where infrastructure is likely to be in this next five years, um, hugely immense immensely, immensely um, required for our ability to look back when you see our forecast being accurate. It really is the relationship that the planners um, and such provide to us and being able to understand what the future means for your community. Uh, the only thing I would add to that is I think um, I've said this before and I, I'm even coming into this community six years ago, I was incredibly impressed with the partnership, uh, the intentional partnership between the city, the school district, and the park district, um, reflected by the amount of shared space that we have uh, to purposely make sure that when each entity is working on a respective project, uh, they are partnering, whether it's through opportunities, looking at land swaps, shared opportunities to save taxpayer dollars um, by working together. And that partnership continues. Uh, our director of facilities currently sits on the city of Argos growth plan. We have ongoing meetings with the park district and the city at not only the facilities maintenance level, but also at the leadership level as well um, that we continue to work on for that very uh, specific purpose. So. Um, I think that just reflected in the amount of shared spaces that you'll see in all of our schools from swimming pools to parks, um, and you'll see a tremendous amount of collaboration between the city, the school district, and the park district. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Dr. Gandhi. Rob, I have two questions, if that's all right with you, and I'll maybe start with the first one. It's around development. Um, 
so I believe pages 27 through 29 is where you're talking or showing a little bit of uh, what the future development is going to look like on the south side. And you had a, uh, the map with the bar graphs that are showing where the future development is. Most of that development looked east of the interstate where there is more flood, or sorry, west of the interstate where there is more flood protection. So in that development piece where you're showing within 10 years, you had the purple, that's going to be what we expect. Is that truly 10 years knowing now that the diversion is going to be completed in 2027? Or can that purple become one of the colors where that 10-year development plan might become a five-year development plan in the flood protected areas once that's complete? Yeah, great, great question. And the answer is each year, if we went back and looked at where we target things, let me go back one map of what's current, what could be in five years, and what's towards 10 years. It's based on where the infrastructure is and who owns the land and where they are in the process with the city. So I would suspect that when we get to 2028, some of the areas here on the south side and, and west of the interstate might turn to yellow and there might be some places where they become a current project. So for sure, it, it could change um, based on who owns the land and as the infrastructure um, gets associated to those parcels. Thank you. Uh, my second question is over the last couple of years, as we've looked at this report and just the projections, some of the biggest variability uh, has been at kindergarten, and we've talked kind of extensively because of COVID, um, not knowing, you know, sometimes some more students, I use the phrase, were redshirted versus previously before. Uh, but also one of the things that you had mentioned last year was that that's because aside from live birth, one of the only other data sources was census, and census ca captures that zero to four category. Now that we are coming off a couple years off of COVID, do you think that we are getting more towards accurate kindergarten projections looking solely off of live birth and that 0.4 time frame is kind of timed out? Or do you think that there's still some variance that we can expect um, in the projections specifically to that kindergarten grade level? I believe we're going to have more variance in the kindergarten than ever before. And I think some of that is what we've seen this year with 783 or about 32% of what that market share with live births are. So one of the things that we've started trying to target because of the way in which we look at the district, where we're breaking things down by development types, is there some trends that we're seeing with something specific on choices that families might be making for other programming? So we have the census data um, we have a, a better sense, right? 2020, we're in 2023, um, 2024 actually, but we're close enough to the census data where we get a sense of what that median age is in some of these areas. Um, so we're trying to develop some other ways in which we can look at this even beyond the live birth um, date, uh, data. And so I think that the variance is, is going to continue and it's going to continue with not only the choices that families may make in delaying when they bring their kids into the public system or what uh, programming their kids get, but when those children were born. So if they were born more in October, November, and December, um, we will have a year's delay for those kids. So some of the things that we ideally would like to get from the North Dakota Department of Health <coughs> is a breakdown by the month that they're born. Um, because that would be a lot more helpful in our ability to target, you know, are we going to be closer to um, 900 kindergartners or is it going to be 800 kindergartners? We're kind of limited by some of the data sets. Thank you. All right, anything else? Okay, thank you so much for your presentation and taking the time to really walk us through that. Um, next, I would look for a motion to approve our consent agenda. Yes, Jim. I'll move adoption of the consent agenda with the addition of the human capital addendum to be added to item 6B. Second. Thank you. Moved by Jim and seconded by Tracy. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor, please say yes. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. 
All right, thank you. Motion passes. Next, we'll move on to our business, uh, starting with 7A, the superintendent evaluation. Um, thank you very much for your thoughtful comments. I um, try to compile them all into a composite memo um, reflecting almost everyone's uh, individual statements. So to um, entertain any discussion, I would look for a motion to, um, yes, Katie. I move that the board approve the annual evaluation of the superintendent indicating satisfactory performance and place a copy of the report in the superintendent's personnel file. Second. Thank you. Moved by Katie and seconded by Tracy. Any discussion? Our, yes, Jim. I'll just take this moment to thank you for the last year of service and looking forward to the next 10. All right, anything else? Okay, um, I will just echo gratitude as well. I think uh, from our statements, uh, you can see that we all deeply appreciate your service and thank you so much. So without any further comments or questions, I would look for Anne Marie to call the roll, please. Day. Yes. Holden. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Nelson. Yes. Newman. Yes. Christensen. Yes. Clark. Yes. Berklin. Yes. Motion passes. Moving on to item B. Uh, which comes to us through memo number 95. And Dr. Gandhi, I would look to you to introduce this for us, please. Thank you. Uh, so earlier this fall, the board was asked uh, to give us approval to submit an innovation waiver to the North Dakota Department of Public Instruction so we can begin the planning processes for a self-directed academy. Uh, that is a two-stage process where we have to spend the majority of the school year doing our research and working with the Department of Public Instruction to build out what that school model will look like, and then we submit another innovation waiver. What we are seeking today is your approval. Um, we, are, we are very confident in working with the Department of Public Instruction that the innovation waiver will be granted, so we are officially seeking your approval to begin the process of um, rolling out our communications plan and starting enrollment for this school. To be able to start the enrollment for this school, we have to now, we have to show in board minutes to the Department of Public Instruction that our board has approved this school and the grade level configuration. So then they will give us a plant number that we can input into PowerSchool and then allow parents to register for the school. So all of the information around the self-directed academy, the where, the why, the how, is all in the informational book that is provided to you. We are very excited about this opportunity. I can't tell you today uh, if it's going to be 50 students or <coughs> where we start with one learning studio that we're looking at up to 100 or 120 students, if that's what's going to happen. I think once we start rolling things out um, and we start seeing how registration is going, we'll be able to have a more definitive idea of where the numbers are going. But we do know that we have several staff um, and students and families that we have talked to that are excited about this opportunity, including some of our staff that are considering the opportunity for their own children. Where this concept started is really taking a look at structurally, so Strategic Initiative 6 for us focuses on continuous improvement and where we're seeing disparate outcomes for some of our students. And we often, as a system, try to look at where are there some opportunities that structurally are a barrier for students, even though that is not necessarily reflective of their cognitive ability. Uh, time is a barrier to education, uh, and the reason for that is the traditional model of public school requires a student or a teacher to take anywhere from 100 to 175 state standards that they are responsible for teaching, embed those into a 175 instructional day calendar, and when you have 20 or 30 students at a day, you create what's called the pacing calendar, and that pacing calendar is when you introduce that new material to students. Well, if students are absent or they're more mobile, we have between a 30 and 40% mobility rate in our school district, they might miss the instruction on a certain day that was provided and the assessment that was provided. So when the students are then taking a summative assessment on the back end, um, they might 
underperform, not because they don't have the ability to show that they can learn and show proficiency in that mastery of that standard that was taught, but solely because they weren't there at that moment in time. And that could be a lot of students, when we're not talking about students that have one-off absences here and there that can make up that work with the teachers. We're talking about students that are coming into our district or sometimes the students that, that need to learn at a different way and a different pace as well. So this was modeled after one of the spotlight innovation schools in the nation coming out of Wilder, Idaho. Why Wilder, Idaho? Because they have an uh, entirely migrant fam uh, community that they serve with over a 95% um, I think it's a over 65%, sorry, uh, mobility rate in their community. So they had a lot of students that were leaving their school districts and coming back, and they realized if they took time away as a constant and allowed students to learn at their own pace, where teachers aren't bound by a pacing calendar, they're bound by working with each individual student on the standards that they need to do. Um, it's been wildly successful, and it's been a model that we've thought that would be very successful for some of our students. We know that uh, sometimes there's even a current movement in the professional workplace where uh, employees are choosing to work more with their um, archaic rhythm where they feel like in the morning I'm doing better in certain areas. That's where my brain works better. So I want to do more of my bigger cognitive loads in the morning and my more medial tasks in the afternoon. This allows students to do that. Uh, you have the opportunity to earn, to learn. If you want to focus on math in the morning or you want to focus on your one algebra project for two weeks, you could do that because essentially what it is is that you're going through a goal setting process. You're building the executive functioning skills that we are going to embed through the, the 16 habits of a mind curriculum to develop your skills to goal set and then work while your teacher's progress monitoring. All of the instruction in this building is still in person. It's just not bound by time. So this is not a hybrid model. This is not a virtual model. It's still an in-person model. Uh, in terms of the location, the building, uh, I think it's, the, it's mapped out in the informational book, but the building is uh, its going to be starting off at Agassiz. Uh, that's where we will start with the first learning studio for students that are in 6th through 8th grade. We are hoping that the long-range plan will identify the future site for this building, uh, and the goal is to see if that's a choice opportunity for students that will eventually expand to a K-8 model, uh, for up to 400 students. Each learning studio is a group of educators that will work with 100 and, to 120 students. And that's going to be where our partnership with the next educational workforce coming out of Arizona State University is going to look at that. And I, we use the term a group of educators because it might be some student teachers combined with certified teachers with some paraprofessionals. Uh, the other part of that is because so much of this school is built on independence, learning at your own direction, your own autonomy. We want to make sure that students have that familiarity, so we're going to introduce looping as well. So um, currently it's going to start as a 6-8 model. The 6th through 8th graders will stay with the same group of educators for all three years that they're there, um, unless we have staff turnover, which could happen as well, but that's going to be the model. Uh, we haven't determined when we expand to K-8. Will it be a K-8 looping? Will it be a two-year looping? I think those conversations will come as we look at expanding that as well. So we're really excited about providing this opportunity. Uh, we in Fargo Public Schools, um, there are a couple of big pieces for us as we roll out this school, the, the next board memo, and different opportunities for students. We use the term different school for if it's going to have a different plant number by DPI. You are physically enrolled into a different school. Uh, for everything else, uh, if it's just an extension of an opportunity that we're providing, we use the term program. So the Trollwood Mentorship Program is the term program because that's an extension opportunity of our virtual academy. This is a different school because it is a structurally different school. Uh, a couple things that were important for us as we wanted to make sure that we were addressing the need of variety of learners that we had in our school district was we wanted to stay away from the traditional concept of a magnet school where you have to have a selective criteria to get in. So for us, we want to create an opportunity for any student or family in Fargo Public Schools to take advantage of this opportunity, and they will be receiving shuttle transportation from their home middle school campus. So we do believe that we're able to do that. So the schedule has been designed so students can just go to the middle school that they normally would have, have transportation and go to the school, and then also come back by the end of the day to participate in all of the extracurricular or co-curricular activities they had there. 
if we get to the point where our building capacity is full and we have to we do have to cap solely for that reason until we are, the new site is fully determined and we're in that phase by the long range facilities plan we do not want to create a selective criteria for that then we are what our internal conversations have had been at this point have been that we would just start with the youngest grade level so they can stay in that opportunity the large the longest so if we somehow this year said, okay, we really cannot take more than 120 more students and we're reaching that enrollment, then we would have a conversation with some of those eighth graders because they would be there for the shortest amount of time. And we want that looping experience to be part of the students. But uh, it is important for us that two big things for us were, this had to be structurally different. It couldn't just be a school that was a school of best practices because we didn't want to A, create a, a brain drain of expectations that we have for solid instruction across all of our buildings to be there. So the structurally different pieces is the time piece. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that this school was a different opportunity to learn on the tier one end. It is not what the traditional definition is of an alternative school or an opportunity for students that are not successful. That's just not the case. This is the same high expectations that we have in every other classroom. It's just that we are structurally providing a different opportunity where you're not bound by a traditional pacing calendar for the students to be successful there. So we are very excited about this work. We are currently in the process of uh, um, selecting, hopefully we posted and just recently closed uh, the posting for the principal. Once we hire the principal, then we would hire the staff as well uh, in accordance to that workforce model. So myself or Dr. Gross that is online are happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, thank you. Uh, so to kick off our conversation, I would entertain a motion. Yes, Jim. I'll get this started with a motion that the Fargo Board of Education approve the new self-directed academy school in Fargo Public Schools beginning the calendar year 2024-25 school year with a six through eight grade configuration with a goal to ultimately serve students in kindergarten through grade eight in future years. Second. Thank you, moved by Jim and seconded by Namal. Um, any questions or comments? I think I saw Dr. Newman's hand go up first. Um, yeah, thank you. And thank you for explaining this and the details. Um, so if I understand correctly, in the 24-25 school year, we would start with 100 to 120 students, you're saying, and that would involve a team of educators of around five. Um, so when we increase after that school year to up to 400 students, does that mean the number of educators goes to somewhere in the 20 ballpark? And if so, um, just respecting FBA's questions, is that would that be new hires, um, staffing transfers, or how would we do that for 20 educators? Sure, great question. Uh, so in collaboration with the Next Education Workforce model, so that model is a group of five to six educators that work with one learning studio, which is 100 to 120 students. So our vision for future expansion would also be the same way. We would just add a team, uh, 100 to 120 students at a time, and a group of educators are working with those um, uh, with those students. So, And part of that growth and expansion will be dictated by what the future site is. Um, as determined by the long range facilities plan and the time frame in which we're able to access that site. As it relates to kind of just the specific staffing questions for next year, you'll see in your board packet, we put in information on the next education workforce. Uh, we didn't identify what certification for the core teachers as part of this team because part of that model allows that flexibility. You may have some paras that are aspiring teachers and they might be an aspiring teacher in the area of math, but you could balance their expertise even in their role as a para with a certified English teacher and see how that team composite comes to. So part of that model, and Dr. McKenna has been there, so I don't wanna talk on behalf of him, he'll be able to share a lot more, um, is to find the right people that are working with the students that can build the relationships and progress monitor. Um, it's almost every week of looking at the student data and staying on top of them, but it's not bound by, you have to have your traditional model of a math teacher, an English teacher, like which would be five FTEs. Um, this could be five FTEs, but two certified teachers, a couple um, student teachers, a couple of paraeducators to be that team. Uh, the additional FTEs that you see in your board packet, that is to loop in the opportunity for 
specials. So music, world language, and so forth. That's why in that board packet, there are like some 0.4s, 0.2s. Some of that might change. That's based off of Dr. Gross's working on staffing for next year based on course selection and those opportunities of who, which teachers might be able to push in some of those services, but they might not be full-time employees of the self-directed academy. Um, Tracy, I forgot your last question. I apologize. <laughs> Um, no, it's great. So when we eventually, because if I'm reading correctly, the plan would be to eventually go up to 400. Mm -hmm. Where do, does that mean we go to 20-ish educators, and where does that staffing come from? Yeah, so uh, it will just be dependent on our enrollment. So if um, if the majority of the students are coming in from our school districts and it's looking at providing internal opportunities for staff to apply for that, then we absolutely can do that. But if it's coming in for more individuals taking advantage of this choice opportunity and our enrollment coming up, then we might have to hire some more FTEs as well. So I, I, we won't know until we know where the, where the students are coming from. That makes sense. Thank you. All right, thanks. Other questions, comments? I yes, have Kate. One, Melissa. Oh, sure. Oh. Um, I'll go Robin and then Katie. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, I had the exact same question about non-public. Can you explain that term as it's defined within the North Dakota De public of public, sorry, Department of Public Instruction? Because I think that's a tricky term that we all need to understand. Uh, thank you for the question. I'll be happy to do that. I th that's for the next memo for the Mental Health Therapeutic School at the Explore Academy, so I'll, I can probably best answer that question during that oh, agenda item. So sorry, I'm going through my list here. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments, Robin? No, that's it. Okay, and then Katie? Um, yeah, so I'm a little curious then about when you were answering um, Dr. Newman's question. So when I'm looking at this little picture in the, it's got the, four groups, one, two, three, four, does each group need to have a licensed teacher? Because the way you made it sound was like some people might be a licensed teacher, but somebody might be a para or something else. So is there like a minimum number of licensed teachers or how does that work out with how we piece this together? I'm gonna to kick it to Dr. McKenna for okay. that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so the staffing is really gonna be unique dependent on the kids. And so one of the things we learned at the Next Education Workforce uh, when we went there to Arizona as a North Dakota coalition is that within the uniqueness of each of the sites we visited, they staffed a little bit differently. So as we work through the vision of what this is going to look like um, and how we're going to staff it, it's all about fit, right? This is not a school where you just place people that um, may not fit the criteria. So we're still working through that with the building principal that will hire. Uh, the posting just closed, and so we'll go through that process. And then once we take a look at the number of kids that are enrolled, we'll start with a core group and then work on what that staffing is going to look like. Typically, you might have one or two core teachers, but you also embed within that clinical residents or student teachers along with paraprofessionals. So it's really... Um, Without rambling, it's a lot of collaborative discussion. Students are grouped, um, regrouped flexibly as needed to work through um, um, the lessons that they're currently working on. And so if you have two teachers, what we're going to be looking for is teachers that have uh, certifications that um, are not isolated to one academic core area. Yes. And the only thing I'll add on that uh, just for clarity is yeah, that's going to be part of the model, right? Because you may have teachers that have multiple certifications, but uh, the non-negotiables that we have, they will be met. So the teachers will, we will have teachers that can provide uh, special education services, 504 services, and all of those pieces. Uh, those are just required. So that's why we work with uh, DPI. It, it might be certain, only two teachers that are certified in multiple areas, but all of those services that we do provide in our traditional schools are still going to be required to be provided there. Teachers will just have to have that endorsement. Can I keep going? Okay, thanks. Um, I think, um, obviously, you and I 
communicated via email. I appreciated your answers. I'm just trying to wrap my head around how all this works. And I, I do think Mr. Kraft brought up a couple good points too. Um, could you speak to, I mean, if this is eventually going to be 400 kids, like that's a lot of kids from our middle schools. So do you anticipate, how is that going to impact our middle school enrollment and the number of teachers and staff that we need in those buildings? I can't tell you until I know, like, you know, how many students are there. I mean, and, and it, it's going to be a counterbalance between what our enrollment is at that time and our students coming in. Uh, but if there's 400 students are taking advantage of this opportunity, then that means there's 400 students that need something structurally different, right? Um, the entire premise of, you know, I don't want to summarize for, on behalf of Mr. Grant, but what I took away is that we have to kind of balance the outcomes that we want to be able to provide with students and then the different opportunities that we want because we are a little bit limited in terms of time resources that we, we can provide. But um, we know that if that takes away from our traditional schools and that's where some of our, that's the opportunity that we need to provide, obviously we as a school district um, will share that with our staff and say here's where we need additional staff to work under this model because it's being more successful for some of our students. And if we have a greater need than 400 students, then I would think that we would then have to look at does this opportunity need to expand or go into our traditional schools. But uh, the school district in Wilder, Idaho, this is the their entire school district model, K-12. They're a smaller school district, so they have two buildings, and they're able to provide that. We are a little bit different with 11,000 students at 23 buildings, so we're able to start at one school and then see. Uh, but I don't see, and I could be wrong, I can't predict the future here, but I don't see where the entire student population would benefit from not having a traditional pacing calendar and structure. I think that that's gonna be beneficial for some students. And then I think there's gonna be a different need for different students that want to learn at their own self-direction piece as well. And that's why it's been so important for us to make sure that when we create a different choice opportunity, it is structurally different and it cannot be something that can be replicated in our traditional buildings. Because if it could, then we would push for that to happen. But we do know that there are just some students that need to learn differently. And if that need is as great as 400 students are sitting in our current buildings, I'd rather align our resources to meet those needs for those students. Tracy. I just have an offshoot to that question. Um, thank you, Katie. So if there were to be this migration or even half of that, um, I mean, I know we're asking you to look into a crystal ball a little bit, but if we were to have decreasing, you know, enrollment in our buildings, do we foresee that affecting some of the specialized programs that are offered? And how would that be handled if that were the case? I think some examples said tonight were foreign languages or music or other. I, I think the conversation at that point would just be, because um, we're not looking at right now removing any specialized programming from any of our schools. In fact, uh, the reason that the information book has some of those smaller FTEs is that we're trying to make sure that even the self-directed academy has an opportunity for those specialized mm -hmm. programs. So I think the difference in this conversation is that I don't view this as a threat to our comprehensive schools. I just view this if it decreases the amount of students at our comprehensive schools or traditional schools, then I view the need to maybe those schools or those teachers to provide the same instruction in a different model um, where they're not following a traditional pacing calendar. But the need for world language, foreign language would still be dictated by the amount of students. If 400 students go from traditional pacing calendar to self-directed music, the need for music is still there. We would just have to t work with our staff to say, hey, there's a large amount of students that don't want to follow that traditional model of how music's been delivered, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah great. Um, so kind of related, um, the way I, like I'm thinking, right, if the, the this new school, this new model kind of um, grows to the point that we think it might, right, I know we're still in the midst of conversations with the planning committee and long range facility planning about like where this school ends up being physically located, right? Knowing Agassiz is unlikely to be a long-term home. Um, are, could, could we foresee opportunities to um, almost have like this 
middle school model coexist in a shared space with a traditional model in order to potentially take advantage of some of the resources, whether those be teachers or facilities, right? I'm thinking, you know, if, if you know, the concern of music was brought up, right? I mean, if we have a bunch of middle school students, if we have two schools in the same building, right, we can share potentially different resources, right? Um, I don't know if that would be staff, right, because they're, that's a very specialized model, but, you know, maybe a band room or, you know, something like that. three mics that turn off on me. I think this is like my wife's dream come true. Um, <laughs> I, I would say that uh, the great question, Greg, um, I think ultimately I can't answer that because that would be a group discussion with planning and everything else. What I would caution you uh, there, though, if this school expands to the point where it's 400 students, kindergarten through eighth grade, that school's gonna wanna have their own identity and they're gonna want to have, because we are working really, really hard um, to redefine choice, school choice, not just politically, because that term is used for something different than school choice, but also um, what alternative education means. And I think there's been a historical negative connotation with alternative education, meaning students that have subpar cap capabilities, and that's just not true when you can learn different. So I think the answer to your question would be the same question about um, over the last couple of years why we have um, had extensive discussion on not moving you know, Dakota High School to be within South High School uh, because that school and students want their own identity and their own branding as well. And I think that would be, have to be part of that conversation for the board and us to consider together. Okay, any other questions? I, I did have one. Um, I, I see that there's sort of a proposed daily schedule, but is it anticipated that this school would follow the traditional calendar that the other, that all of our other schools are on? Great question. Yes. Uh, when we first started this project, we thought that because of the nature of the self-directed academy, we uh, this might be turned into a year-round school that we would propose. As we started working with Wilder, looking at opportunities for students, and part of this process started with us doing empathy interviews with students and parents mm -hmm. about what are, what are they looking for if they want to do do or see school differently. What we recognize is that for those that want the year-round opportunity, we can do that through summer school and provide an extension summer school opportunity that is still reflective of the self-directed model. But we don't need to pigeonhole everyone that wants a self-directed instruction to have to be in a 12-year school. So uh, yes, this will follow the same traditional school calendar. Uh, it's just what happens within the time that you're there is different than what's in a traditional school. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, Greg. Uh, so w one thought I had was, um, right, this is at its core an innovative, newer idea, right? And um, when I think of that, I think of, right, it's almost like a calculated risk, which I, I think may have negative connotations, but I think also very positive. Um, but my, my thought with that is, um, how long, um, do you think it would, um, like the school and the uh, implementing this model, how long do you think it would take before, um, we'll really have a good sense of whether or not, um, it's achieving the, the needs, um, that we're intending for it to, to achieve? I love these questions. I think part of that is going to be dependent on what happens with agenda item 7D, right? What are the expectations that we are setting for the school district to, to measure success and the outcomes that we want? Uh, full candidness, last year uh, at our secondary principals meetings, 
a majority or a good portion of our conversations focused around how to support some of our learners that were in school truant, that were not leaving the building, but were um, still skipping class in the school. That's some of the students that we did interview with and talk to them about what is that model. And part of that was that they want to be able to learn at their own pace. They want to focus on what they think is important at that time, but still have instruction in person. And it was, it was profound for us to recognize the amount of learners that when we look at our discipline data and when we look at uh, start interviewing with students, recognizing the amount of students that don't necessarily skip to go home, but still want to stay in the building because they have that sense of community uh, and that attachment to the school too. So if we find out that it's a smaller number than anticipated uh, of enrollment, but for that smaller number, the outcomes are better because part of this school design, an unofficial vision that we had, which is possible for some students in the school is, what if you had school where skipping is not possible? And you, there is a status where if you can get to level three or level four status in this school, skipping is not possible because you can literally be where you want in the space because you will be in a space with an adult learning at your pace and at instruction that you want. Um, so I think that will come back to the board as a conversation about do the student outcomes that we are seeing for the smaller group of students um, is that the investment that we think is appropriate to put them in the setting that they want? I think that's the same conversation we had when we opened up the Explore Academy. And to be honest, that's kind of how I define equity as well, which is not giving everyone the same experience, but giving every child what they need to be successful. Other questions or comments? All right, hearing none. Anne Marie, would you please call the roll? Holden? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Newman? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Clark? Yes. Day? Yes. Berklin? Yes. Motion passes, and we will move on to item number 7C, memo number 96. And again, I'll look to you, Dr. Gandhi, to introduce this for us. Thank you. I will start and I might kick it over to our general counsel, Tara Brandner, uh, as well. Uh, this is uh, a request um, for the board to allow us to co-locate a therapeutic treatment school at the Explorer Academy starting the next school year. The purpose for that request is that as a public entity, we have many limitations as a public school. Um, or a public school district or a public school in general. Uh, some of those limitations are based on seat time. That is why at the self-directed academy we have to seek an innovation waiver. But more than that, the biggest limitation is that when it comes to the services that we provide our students, our scope governed by the Department of Public Instruction is limited to K-12 academics. And we know that as we talk about the big broad spectrum of mental and behavioral health, uh, I think many of you have heard me talk about this during legislative session, is that there isn't clarity in terms of when does the role of an educator who provides mental and behavioral health wraparound services stop, and when does the role of a licensed provider that can provide mental and behavioral health treatment begin. And uh, it's, I think, something as a society that we haven't defined yet, but we haven't defined for parents in our community when you go to a treatment provider versus what is in the realm of the school. But the school is challenged by two things. One is billing. We are very limited in the codes that we can provide and bill for, whether it's through a family's insurance or even as a provider, because we are not considered a health provider that gets funding from the health and human services. So outside of a few codes, even when we provide mental and behavioral health services to our students. Oftentimes during COVID, we invested in um, working with companies to bring in and provide mental health services. They were only, they were limited. They were only able to go to a certain level of doing check-in meetings and initial visits with our students and staff. And then once they required more individual treatment, they had to work directly with those, with those students. So the only way that we are able to provide that is to work with um, we worked with the Department of Public Instruction. Actually, we've been in conversations with them for about a year to a year and a half. And per their recommendation, they said what you should really do is 
find an entity that is funded and governed through the Health and Human Services that provides treatment to students and mm -hmm. partner with them to open up a non-public school on your site. Because when you're a non-public school, you don't have the accountability to time and billing that limits a public school district. So a non-public school can then actually prioritize the treatment needs for students and allow us as a school district to provide the academics based on that student's treatment plan versus saying that while the student's in our purview, the majority of the time has to be spent on their academics. So we are requesting that at the Explore Academy for some of our students that may need treatment at a greater pace and greater time with more continuity to be able to provide them and push in academic services versus saying that you have the setting D facility where we can provide more limited in scope wraparound services but the end responsibility for us is still solely that academics and never get those students that treatment need that they need. So this really is an opportunity for us to address on the preventative end, on the early end, um, what we are seeing as some of uh, mental and behavioral treatment needs for our community, but really trying to help some of our learners that we know that their families are working around the clock, but when they're with us, we won't be able to get to the academics unless we can identify their treatment need first and get them their treatment, but we can't be a treatment provider because we're educators and not healthcare providers. So this is an avenue to partner together with the healthcare provider to bridge that gap. Okay, uh, I would look for a motion so we can start our discussion. Yes, Tracy. Um, thanks. I move that we approve opening a non-public day treatment center operated by a partnering agency to be located at the Explorer Academy with the Fargo Public School District being the executive or exclusive provider of academic instruction at the non-public day treatment center. Second. All right. Moved by Tracy and seconded by Namal. Any discussion? Yes, Katie. Um, yeah. Okay. So I, what I'm curious about, and I think Robin mentioned this sooner or earlier, um, so it sounds like the treatment center would be the non-public school. Why do they need to be a non-public school and not just a contractor that provides treatment? So this goes back to a little bit of what I shared earlier of, um, is it a program or is it a school? And if they were a contractor and the students were still enrolled under our public school status, even with a contractor, we're limited in billing, and then we're limited by seat time and some other pieces where we are not able to prioritize the treatment over the academics. So the fact that we can open up a non-public school gives us the flexibility to push in academics around treatment versus our obligation as a public school district to only focus on academics and, and be limited in the treatment that we can provide or contract, even through a contracted provider. Thank you. Um, so then the treatment side, are they Fargo Public School employees, the people who provide the treatment? No, they are healthcare providers that can assess a treatment need. Okay. Okay, Greg? So um, I think the, the end result, right, the goal that we're, we're trying to achieve with um, this program or this arrangement, um, I, like, I, I think that it's, it's very, I think it's a, it's a great thing for us to, to be working towards and um, trying to accomplish. Um, the, like, my biggest concern with it, reading, you know, the memo, I'm kind of stems off what Robin and Katie were saying. It's like, oh, we're a public school and we're trying to get a non-public school open. Um, but I'm uh, encouraged by you, uh, Dr. Yanni, mentioning that uh, DPI is not only aware of, but more or less proposed that this, pl this plan, um, and I guess my question would be to maybe to Tara to reassure me that this is legal? That's a great question. So I would note that we are not opening the non-public school. The service provider that we ultimately award a bid to 
they will work with DPI to receive a non-public school status. They will be solely providing that service to our students, and then we will be providing the educational services. We do this in other areas now, like Luther Hall, we currently have an agreement with where they're a, a non-public school, and we provide push-in educational services. So it would be very similar to some of the instances that we already have. Oh, um, didn't see who was first, but let's go Tracy and then Dr. Gandhi. I, I actually have an offshoot. That's reassuring to hear. Thank you. So one of my questions was, does this non-public status, will this in any way affect our Fo Fargo Public Schools staff and teachers in like the way they're treated versus our, the public status or the way we've done negotiations with that group, et cetera? It will not. Our public school employees will still be our employees. They will still push in and provide the services that they they currently are providing. They will just be providing them to our same students. Um, they just will be enrolled in that non-public school operated through that, that third party. But it would not impact the way that we contract with them at all. They would still be our employees. All right, Dr. Gandhi. Yeah, and I, I should have started with this. I apologize. I think some of the questions with uh, the term non-public and then this being on a board memo for business might be throwing some things off. I should have started by sharing that, like, this doesn't, the reason that this is for the board um, for approval is because of one of the ELs that focuses on the, the loose interpretation on um, primary, changing the primary purpose of a facility. I don't think we are. We're still trying to push academics around the treatment. Uh, but the actual approval for this would go through the provider's board, and then they'll get the plant number from DPI. For the assurance of is this legal, and, and because DPI has walked us through this, I'll just give the examples that DPI has been using in this year and a half of planning to get us to this point. Uh, so first and foremost, Dakota Boys and Girls Ranch used to be an extension of Fargo Public Schools before they broke out on their own. And this would be kind of going back to that model that's been discussed in our conversations with DPI. The examples they've used is Luther Hall, but except for it being residential, this would be the day treatment program. They've uh, alluded to the work that they're doing, I think, in Bismarck or Mandan with Home on the Range. So these are examples that they are utilizing, um, and it's also prevalent in other parts of the state in some shape or form to be able to provide those opportunities as well. Thank you. Yep, Nimal. Well, as you all know already, I love talking about mental health. Anything that help our students, you know, is always um, on my mind. Um, my question is, um, I know that uh, Katie and Dr. Newman uh, did discuss based on some of the staffing too as well. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and probably you already know that, you know, um, I'm just wondering about, even though it is a non-public self academy by itself, its own identity, um, would it be, uh, my question was, I know that there will need, you definitely mentioned that there is a collaboration and so forth, but at the same time, we still have issues here too within our public schools uh, regarding mental health and counseling, you know? And um, and and for me, when I went to them and sit down with them and see how they work, it's it's a lot. It take a lot of time. They barely even get like um, break to go to um, to go eat their lunches and so forth. And that's what I'm concerning about. Uh, why are we not adding more counselor into our own public school instead of the non? I don't know if that fit there. Actually, it does. Um, respectfully, I think your question does draw complete reason why we have this need. Mm -hmm. uh, because counselor is another one of those terms where everyone has their own definition of what a counselor should be. And the professional training for a school counselor is different than the professional training for a counselor that's providing mental and behavioral health services. And without that lack of role clarity and identification of what's treatment versus what schools our educators but mainly our counselors are often expected to be able to accomplish a lot more than that's outside their scope and training as an educator because the community expectation is that they're a provider counselor and and that's what we're really trying to do here is partner with an organization that can provide the treatment 
independent of the academics that we are providing. Right. Any other comments Fred. or questions? Oh, Fred. did I hear President Robin? President. Did I hear you? Yeah. Yes, I think this is great dialogue. What I, what I'm surmising here is this partnership with external third party providers is a culmination of what our state legislature has been working on for a long time. The crossover of billing for mental health services versus education and how to integrate them has always been a, a sticky wicket, if you will. And I think that the mechanism at a higher level has been allowed by our state legislature. And I think our district is interpreting that to bring those services to our kids that they could not otherwise. So I will be in full support of this motion. Thank you for your work. Um, and I, I do feel that, that this is exactly what our state legislature had in mind through community requests. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Greg, did you have an, oh, and Katie? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, um, my, my, uh, last question is, um, I, I, I know we're like, we can't submit or receive any requests for proposals uh, for partnering organizations until we get past this stage. Um, but do we have any sort of um, like idea or projection on how um, this unique arrangement might impact our budget um, since there's going to be students enrolled legally in a non-public, non-FPS school? Not at this time, because we've submitted the RFP. Uh, when we started this about a year ago, we did visit with a variety of providers in town and said that if we explore this model, is this something that you would potentially submit a proposal on? And they said yes, and I think some of the pieces, uh, should we find someone that is a qualified candidate to get the bid? Um, Cost might be offset by rent and some of the other decisions that are going to come through that process. So I can't give you a definitive number now because um, there's some the pieces that we'll have to figure out is the the treatment for students that may not have insurance or an ability to pay, and we still want to be, the district wants to cover that versus the rent for the spaces that they're using. Some of the other pieces will also be whether or not we as a district allow them to provide services before or after. Uh, similar to the arrangement that we made with TNT Kids and Fitness um, when we opened up that set of services at the Explore Academy as well. So I think that will happen once we go through this RFP process. And I believe we are either just started or about to launch the 21-day advertising period. Um, and then we'll be able to select the provider from there and sh share more of that info. Thank you. And Katie, did you have a question too? Are you sure? Okay. Um, Without any other comments or questions, Anne-Marie, would you please call our roll? Johnson? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Newman? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Clark? Yes. Day? Yes. Holden? Yes. Berkland? Yes, motion passes. Moving on to our final item of business, motion, uh, memo number 97 addresses this, our strategic plan. Dr. Gandhi, would you please introduce this for us? Thank you. Uh, as most board members know, our district refreshed uh, its strategic plan the last couple of years, and then even last year and this year, we have been working extremely hard as an organization to look at what are some of those strategic outcomes that we want. Uh, the reason that we've been honing in more on strategic prioritization is a couple of reasons. One, we were expecting what we now know, which is ESSER funds, which was um, a huge infusion of federal dollars for COVID relief that were given to the district. Um, almost a third of our general fund budget uh, will no longer be available to us. So how do we adapt our practices as an organization? Secondly, uh, some of the pieces that you heard today from um, updates or even public commentators about how do you balance the wide variety of experiences and outcomes that we want to monitor in our students and the experiences that we want to offer when you know that you have limited time, energy, and resources as a district. So that's what your strategic uh, plan is for. And 
over the last couple of years, when we've been updating the strategic plan and the operational plan, we've been giving them to you as two separate entities or two separate documents, operational plan being the scope of work, strategic plan being what was adopted uh, by the board. In reality, your operational plan should be the strategies that feed your, the outcomes that you want in your strategic plan. The board monitors results, and results are purposely big and broad and more ambiguous because it is hard at a leadership level with the amount of variables that we have to be able to capture any one or two outcomes when we know that there's a variety of different ways you can measure school experiences and you can measure success. However, we also owe it to the board as staff to come up with how we, what are some of those measures that we want to utilize uh, to show you that we believe we are making reasonable progress towards those results. I think that is uh, something that staff needs to do and we need to be as an organization aligned on some of those key outcomes. In the past, uh, our strategic plan has had results and then they've had standards and then we've chosen the different data sets that we've presented to you. But it doesn't give you the continuity of year after year to take a look at which of those data sets are most um, that you want to take a look at, which outcomes that you want to look at to see if we're moving in a direction that we are as an organization. So when we had a work session about a year and a half ago, we asked you what are some of those data sets and you gave us some general categories, literacy, performance, graduation rate, so forth. But even then, there needs to be a contextualization of that data and there needs to be some goals that we set. So you have this large piece of paper that we've given you that kind of just gives you the framework of our strategic plan. And you, we have our strategic initiative and then the results. But one of the things that we added this year is measures. Measures are internal goals that we do think that the staff should create, but we should create them ahead of time to tell you, here's the goal that we're striving for. We will not hit all of our goals. I'll tell you that right now. But a year from now, we want to tell you, here's the work that we put in. Here's the money that we put in. Here's the time and energy we put in to hit these goals. And Here's the reasons that we were able to or we were not able to and why we still think we made reasonable progress. And if the board at that moment in time says, you know what, we do want to focus in and hone in on the, improving this outcome, but we know it's going to come at a cost of something else, then maybe we need to lower the goal for something else or say, hey, focus on these measures versus something else. But we need some of those guiding principles, just like we would for a long-range facilities plan of like, what are some of the non-negotiables or the core principles of the board that we are all working towards as an organization to drive our behavior and our action so we don't dilute what the measure of success is for a school district. And, and some of that stuff is more prevalent now because public education has been under fire and we know that sometimes anyone can use any one data point to be wrongfully evaluate the work of our teachers, our students, our staff, or even our leadership as a school district. But then the second reason is when you're coming off of a large infusion of dollars that have been embedded into your budget, uh, sometimes it's a good opportunity to just step back and say, let's go back at zero-based budgeting and see if we have a finite pot of resources, what are the biggest priorities that we want to work towards first? And then let's make sure that we can prioritize those things as funding priority one, then all the other work that we have to do as an organization uh, to keep the train on the tracks as number two, and then recognize that there are other opportunities that maybe we have to lower our expectations or say that, hey, if we want to keep these at the same level that we've been doing, then we're not going to be able to also invest in additional needs here. So in the board memo, even you know as Grant presented today and some of the examples that I've been sharing with the board, I've been purposely using some of these more drastic examples. It is not our intention to go and kind of upset the apple cart and say this is the only thing that we're focusing on as an organization. But it is our intention to say there have to be some sort of goals and ways that we measure success that really relays the vision of the board that that's the biggest priority for us as an organization that we will try to use to drive our decision making and our resource allocation both during the year and when we do that budget building process. And that is why starting this year, we're recommending that we provide your uh, strategic and operational plan in one unified document where the operational plan serves as a strategy to hit the self-identified goals that we have in the strategic plan and then use that as the evaluation of our work 
to see whether or not we're making reasonable progress towards those results. Within the framework of our governance structure, I would strongly hope and recommend that we make this a collaborative process where you can give us feedback on the goals but um, and, and ask us questions, but still allow that to stay in the admin purview. You certainly have within your right to say, nope, we're approving the strategic plan. We want this goal to be one of the priorities or to show limitations through the EL. But our process in developing some of these goals, knowing that some of them are big, some of them are things that we may or may not be able to hit, um, was going through the leadership of each of our strategic initiative teams. So we have restructured our organization um, into, five, into our six strategic initiative teams. So everyone knows that their contribution is towards some of the results for, and they're responsible for a strategic plan. And then we ask them, hey, set your goals for next year because we know that intrinsically that's what's gonna drive their work as well. So that was our process to go about it. Um, very lengthy document. Grant is absolutely right that this is a very, very important document. Um, and we want it to be a very important document because we wanna use this document to be able to communicate. This is what success looks like in Fargo Public Schools. This is what we use to drive our decision making because at the end of the day, we know that uh, unfortunately that we there are trade-offs in the world and there's uh, competing priorities for every individual. Um, and we all have the best intention for students, but there has to be some of that visioning from the board to tell us you, this is the ultimately when, when you have to pick between A or B, we want you to pick towards achieving progress towards this goal over anything else. So that's what our request is. We view this strategic and operational plan as a request of the board to help us drive our work and our budget allocation for the 24-25 school year. All right, thank you. To start our conversation, could I get a motion? Yes, Jim? <coughs> Can I borrow your mic? Sh absolutely. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, of course. I'll move that the Fargo Board of Education approve the Unified Strategic and Operational Plan for 2024-2025 school year. Second. All right, moved by Jim and seconded by Katie. Uh, any discussion or questions for Dr. Gandhi? I have a comment. Yes, Robin. Now I have to find it here. Sorry, I'm toggling between screens tonight. Um, you know, I think what Dr. Gandhi is describing here is talking about uh, recalibrating after federal funds expire just like most organizations are. And my organization is, is in the same situation. So it's a tough time to recalibrate. And I, I hope that we trust his judgment to do so while seeking feedback from interested parties. So thank you for the explanation. That's all. Okay, thank you, Robin. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Greg. Um, I, I know other people have said this throughout uh, the evening, but um, I think um, it really is impossible to overstate the um, importance and, and impact of this unified plan, um, particularly in regards to the Board of Education's role in a pol in our policy governance structure in the district. Um, and so um, I think that um, like we, we've, we've, we've kind of known um, that this change um, was, was coming. Um, but not necessarily seeing drafts of it or knowing what changes to what what changes to each of the plans would happen when we're by combining the two plans um, and there and um, there are some substantive changes that I think um, I know personally I would very much appreciate more time to digest and be able to have questions that I can ask of administration. And I would encourage everybody to do the same um, by, um, I'd like to move to postpone 
this motion um, to our next regular board meeting, um, which is scheduled to be the 26th of March. For a, a point of order to our parliamentarian, if we already have a motion on the floor, are we looking to um, amend that? No, he's moving to postpone the motion. Okay. So this would take precedence. Yes. We would need to. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I think okay. the, the motion itself that, that Jim made is still what I would like to, the motion to be. Okay, thank but you. But I'd like okay. to postpone that until a month, basically a month, a month from, from now. now. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes, Jim. Okay. I'll give him a second. <laughs> okay. Um, I I think I saw Namal's hand go up first for a second, so moved by Greg and then seconded by Namal to postpone until our um, March twenty, I believe it's sixth meeting. Not that. Not debatable. Then we just. It is debatable. Comments or questions on postponement? Yes, Dr. Gandhi. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, so I, administratively, I, I wouldn't have a problem with this being postponed because I think this is important and we want the board to do that. I think, you know, anecdotally, we've talked a lot about policy governance in the past and like a lot, there's a lot of implications with planning because that's how we govern and this is a very big impact of that. What I would share is just um, highlighting some of Greg's comments. Like, if you have questions or concerns, please reach out to administration. And, and I do that versus just waiting for the next board meeting. And I say that because even if the board action is going to wait for a month from now, we have to start the budget building process. And this framework is a new framework completely for us. We have no problem making tweaks, answering questions for the board. But we got to start that budget process. We can't wait a month from now. So I don't see the purpose of, unless I don't want to misrepresent Greg's words, but I don't see the purpose of this to say, stop what you're doing and change the framework. It's let's dive deeper into the work that we're doing, knowing that some of the measures or some things might change. But the overall framework and, and our process to get the budget going for next year is something that, that we probably cannot wait for a month. So as long as we have that, that relationship where you're communicating with us like, hey, Tell us more about this. Maybe this measure needs to change. Those things are fine, uh, but the framework on on using this to drive our budget and our actions for next year, uh, we want to be able to begin that so we can start the budget. And that's the reason for this timing. Thank you, Greg. Any comments to that? Yeah. So I yeah I, I think it is it's fine for me to clarify that I like I, the purpose of my postponement is not necessarily because I personally have found anything that I think requires major address, uh, you know, ch changes or I have major concerns about that would s substantively significantly impact any budgeting decisions. Um, it's more from a, I, I wasn't with everything else in four days, I was not able to digest Every, um, I think I got, maybe if this had been the first memo in business, I might have gotten through it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, like I said, personally, I, I was not able to digest all of it. Um, but given its significance, I, I would like to have that time and would strongly encourage other board members to... Uh, take a lot of time to um, digest it and uh, like Dr. Gandhi said, ask questions when you have them because it is quite involved and they may need time to figure it out. All right, thank you. Um, if there aren't any other comments or questions. Um, I'm just wondering, Dr. Gandhi, if you, you spoke about this too a little bit, if we did postpone it a month from now that we decided to change a measure in the middle of the year because we hit it at a far greater pace than we thought or something else, that should be part of our analysis when we're uh, doing the results monitoring to you. So I see the nature of your questions being around 
the measures, maybe even some of the contents, maybe even change some of those pieces, that would not change our structural process of building a budget around the goals that we have set within the strategic plan. Unless you're looking to completely change a strategic initiative, um, which hasn't changed since we've had kind of the plan, uh, I think we'll be okay. All right, thank you. Um, Anne-Marie, would you please call the roll for our postponement motion? Nelson? No. Christensen? No. Clark? Yes. Day? Yes. Holden? No. Johnson? Yes. Berkland? Yes. Four three. Four three no's or four three? Four, four, three, four yeses. yeses. Okay, three so no's. then we will be moving that item of business to March 26th. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, all right, we are going to move on to our board reports. And um, Robin, if it's all right with you, if, if we could start with you since you're online. Of course, thank you. And please forgive me, I'm toggling between screens from my iPhone since I did not go to work today. I uh, attended the governance committee meeting and then also the C3 tech board meeting. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think I, I believe I heard Seth say that he had to leave, but Seth, if you're on and want to share. Okay, uh, let's move to you, Katie. Um, on February 21st, I had my two by two meeting with um, James and is, Rob is from the right and Robin um, just checking in on the long range facility planning. And then on the 22nd, I attended negotiations. Thanks, Katie. Greg? Yeah, on the 20th, I attended a planning committee. And then that afternoon, I um, uh, attended the health insurance committee meeting. And then on the 21st, um, I also um, got that long range facility plan update. And on the 22nd, I attended negotiations committee. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Namal? Thank you. Hi. Um, I, I went to Ed Clap to attend family bingo night. Um, that was fun. There was a lot of um, a lot of family. It was crowded, but it was nice. Um, I was able to visit uh, Lincoln Elementary School just to check out how they do in there, and and um, sooner or later I will be reading to the students, which is fun. Um, and then also too, I had my one-on-ones um, with the. Long range facility planning on uh, on February 26 because I missed the other one, so that was my fault, Dr. Gandhi. <laughs> James, um, I guess that the day before I was sick, so I guess I didn't I didn't attend that one. I think somehow Anna Marie called me, so that was sorted out. Um, yeah, and then I and then I was able to meet with Victoria regarding DEI works and. And um, those are more around hate and biases. So we'll see sooner or later. Those are all that I got. Thank you, Namal. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, Dr. Gandhi. Sorry for chiming in during your board report. Um, earlier today during the superintendent report, I showed one slide of some of the local uh, community focus groups that we're doing. And I just wanted to go on the record. Um, Greg might relate to this uh, little copy and paste error from Excel because of, they've changed something from timing. So I think it showed the Horace Mann Roosevelt downtown neighborhood was going to be April 6th. It's actually not. It's March 4th at 6 p.m. Um, so just wanted to correct that in case someone looks that on the record for later. So Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then anything else, Namal? No. Nope, All right, you I'm had already good. done. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so on February 20th, I had planning and then governance. 
On February 21st, I had my two-on-two -two with Cooperative Strategies. February 22nd, I had negotiations at noon, and then my uh, community liaison committee was uh, the calendar committee, and we met at 4 p.m. We actually um, could not come to a consensus on two versions of a calendar, so we actually created a third. So now there's three options for um, up for review, and we're going to be meeting again to go over those after we've gotten feedback from our, our peer groups. And on February 23rd, I attended the Ben Franklin um, focus group for the long range facility plan. February, um, and then yesterday, so February 26th, I attended the neighborhood coalition group. Um, they met with Dr. Gandhi, James, Hand, and myself, and it's a, it's a group of, um, they call themselves core neighborhood groups, and they had a lot of questions about the long range facility plan, and we met with them for about 90 minutes and um, had a good conversation, and I believe we're gonna do some follow up with them as well. Um, I did wanna give a shout out to the three time state champions um, for the, the Fargo North South Bruins girls hockey. Um, they had a, an amazing game, 5-1 against Bismarck Century, so it was a really great, and I'm really proud of them. And then on a very somber note, I just wanted to um, extend my condolences to the family and friends of Brian Nelson. Um, he had passed last week, and he was a former board member, and I did not have the privilege of serving with him, but I was always really inspired by his kindness and his steady leadership and his steadfast um, commitment to kids in our district, so he will be deeply missed, and may his memory be a blessing to all of us. All right. Yes. Um, the Long Range Facility me uh, Board meetings, one-on-one, -on -one, it was um, February 23rd. Just want to correct that. Thank you. Thank you. I, those dates can sometimes get a little jumbled. So, All right. Our next regular meeting date is going to be March 26th. It is 7.42 p.m., and we are adjourned.